Welcome today to the house of God as we gather to rejoice, to celebrate, to give thanks in the name of Jesus. I welcome you here this day and I pray God's blessings upon your worship. I want to alert you to one announcement. It's regarding communion. And for those of you who would like to receive communion, you can make arrangements to do so through the church office. There's an announcement to that effect if you'd like to look at the announcement sheet. We make our beginning today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 55, beginning in verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeeded in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. You are my vision, O King of my heart. The thing else satisfies only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, your presence my life. At this time, we join in professing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
At this time, we join together to confess our sins and to hear the words of forgiveness we have in and through Jesus Christ. We pray. Oh God, we admit before each other and you that we have sinned against you in our thoughts and what we have said and both what we have done and failed to do. Our sin against you is our fault, only our fault and entirely. But your word says that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Alleluia. The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Alleluia. Your word says you delight in steadfast love and will have compassion on us and will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Oh God, we pray to you, have mercy on us, forgive our sins, Remove our guilt and lead us to everlasting life in you. Alleluia. The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Alleluia. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you. And for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Alleluia. We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, Help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our sermon text and our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, beginning in chapter 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see... I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of Christ and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. God himself is with us. Let us now adore him and with all appear before him. God is in his temple, all within keep silence, prostrate lie with deepest rest. 
few weeks we've been making our way through 15 essential biblical texts. As we continue to do that this week, let's begin with a prayer. We pray, gracious God, I thank you uh, for your great blessings that you pour out upon us, for the love that you pour out through your Son, for the grace through the cross that's exhibited there. Lord, as we look at your word, from Mark 1 today, I pray that you would use me as your instrument in proclaiming this. And I pray that you would cause us to grow through your spirit. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe an obvious question here, but has anyone ever invited you to a dinner party? I'm guessing that the answer for you is yes. In one of the shows I've been watching, the main character is constantly invited to dinner by one of his friends or co-workers. And whenever he arrives at one of these dinner parties, he always seems to have a gift for the host or the hostess. Sometimes the gift is a bottle of wine. At other times, it might be flowers or a box of chocolate but he's never empty-handed. The show made me think about what makes for a good gift for a host or hostess that's invited you over and what doesn't. While doing a little research on the topic, I came across a list of things that you should never bring to a dinner party. So I figured I'd share it with you. Some of these are the actual gifts and some are just things you shouldn't bring at all. Uh, so the first one on the list is cheap wine or beer. Do not bring cheap wine or beer. Uh, the logic here is you're getting the meal for free, so bring something nice. I like that one. Do not bring an unrequested side dish, especially if it's going to taste better than what's being served. You're not supposed to show the, the host or hostess up. I like this next one. It said, don't bring a Costco or Sam's Club size bag of candy with you. And I guess I'd add to that, don't bring anything Sam Club size or Costco size with you at all. The next one I appreciated a lot, it said, do not bring peanuts in the shell because it's normally appropriate for the host to have to open them and imagine when you left if there were shells all over the floor. Uh, the next one I like, don't bring an uninvited guest with you. Uh, this next one might seem obvious, but nonetheless, do not bring your pet. And the last one I like the most, don't bring a self-help book. You don't want to give your host a complex that they have something wrong with them uh, as they've invited you over. The idea of bringing a gift to dinner had me thinking about the fact that when Jesus came into the world and became one of us, he didn't come empty-handed. From our reading today, which is from Mark chapter 1, we learn that Jesus brings gifts. Jesus brings gifts with him. Today, what I want to do is look at the gifts that Jesus brings. So one such gift that Jesus brings is good news. He brings good news. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but children's books can be very repetitive. 
One such culprit is the book, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? The phrase that repeats in this book is Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? And then we see what Brown Bear gets to look at and it's described there. I can tell you by firsthand experience and from that firsthand experience that by the end of the book, parents are exhausted and just wish that Brown Bear would stop looking around. My sons are older now, one in college, one a senior in high school. So I haven't had to read the book in years, but the very mention of it still gives me chills and, well, nightmares, quite frankly. I can honestly tell you that I believe I read it to them a million times. It may have been something less, it may have been something short of a million, but it felt like a million times at least to me. I read it so many times that I have to confess that I purposely placed it under the other books in their bookcase in a foolish attempt to hide it. Of course, they would always find it. They wouldn't forget about it. They wouldn't pick something else. The day came when the sequel to this book came out. And I was actually relieved that the sequel came out. It was Polar Bear, Polar Bear, what do you see? And the storyline, of course, is the exact same, except that I get to talk about a polar bear when I read it instead of a brown bear. So I rushed out to the store and, and purchased this for them. Now I say all of this as someone who specialized in children's literature in college and who knows the importance of repetition in, in learning and, and hearing those things over and over again. I mean, we learn by reading and hearing things more than one time. I'm certain that this is the reason why the word we translate as good news or gospel, depending upon your translation of the Bible, appears three times in the first chapter of Mark. The very first verse announces that this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, or the beginning of the gospel, again, depending upon your translation. And verse 14 similarly says something like that. It says, and after John had been arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Or how about verse 15, the last part? It's, this is Jesus talking, by the way. Jesus said, repent and believe in the good news. We're reminded three times that Jesus brings good news. What's interesting about the last of these is that it's a call to, it says, repent and believe this good news. The words repent and believe here are known as imperative words, which is to say that they're, they're command words or action words. It's important to know this because we can only really truly experience the good news that Jesus brings if we repent, which is to say recognize our need for God and believe and trust that Jesus brings the gift of good news to us and for us. So as we think about this, we see that Jesus brings the gift of good news. But another gift that Jesus brings is God's kingdom. He brings God's kingdom. I'm a bit of a sports fan, so these past few months have been a little bit difficult and a little bit trying with no sports to be watched. The other day while scanning around channels I found a cornhole tournament on one of the sports channels and I'm ashamed to say that I watched it for more than a few minutes. On another occasion I lingered on a soapbox derby with adults who were the ones driving the cars. I, I lingered on it far too long and I was a bit ashamed as well. But sports fans know that something really big is happening. 
pro basketball, major league soccer, major league baseball, they're all set to resume. Turning back again to Mark 1, we see one of the interesting things about this chapter is that it feels like something really big is happening here too. The sense of something big can be heard in verses 4 and verse 9 as well. Verse 4 begins with the words, And it came about that John the baptizer came into the desert. It says that it came about, those very first words. Some translations actually don't include it, but it's a really important part. And, and this little, little uh, phrase here, this wording here, and it came about, introduces John in this case, who's the forerunner or the one who points to Jesus. The same wording repeats again in verse 9. We already talked about repetition in chapter 1. There's a lot of it here. Verse 9 of chapter 1 says, And it came about in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. So it's Jesus in this case that's introduced. So Mark is describing these really amazing events that were, were happening. The sense of something amazing happening feels even greater when we look again at verse 15, the first part. Again, Jesus talking, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. I want you to notice the phrase, the time is fulfilled, because it's a reminder that God had a timetable and a plan at work. Of course, people had ideas and expectations about what this plan would look like in their minds and in ours too, if we're honest with ourselves. We think we know what the kingdom of God should look like when it comes near. But Jesus always and constantly seems to do the exact opposite of what we expect. Rather than a kingdom based on wealth or power or position, and Jesus comes as a servant ready and willing to suffer for others. Jesus' actions are all about restoring and healing for humanity. And he makes us better through the cross where we are forgiven, where we are made new, where we are called to serve the one who first served us. My prayer for you today is that Jesus, who is God's promise fulfilled, that he would bless and keep you in his grace and mercy this day and always. Let's pray. Gracious God, again we thank you for those blessings you pour out. And in particular today, we thank you for the gifts that, that Jesus brings and pours out upon us. O oh Lord, that gift of promises fulfilled and the kingdom coming near, the gift of good news that is brought to us. Lord, strengthen and keep us in these gifts now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Gracious God, your word has been sown in many ways and places. We pray for missionaries and newly planted congregations around the world. Inspire us by their witness to the faith we share. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, the mountains and hills burst into song and the trees and fields clap their hands in praise. We pray for the gift of creation. Empower us to use wisely that which you have given us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reigning God, we pray for our nation's leaders. Increase their desire for justice and equality. We pray for our enemies. Bridge the chasms that divide us and guide us to a deep and lasting peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Abiding God, care for all who are in need, especially the Kettlers, Janet specifically, as she continues in isolation. For all of those who are looking towards more unemployment, those that are searching for work. For Scott Garish, as he mourns the passing of Amalia. For those who are doubting, renew faith. For those who are worrying, provide release. For those who are struggling, ease burdens. For those in fear, give hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Renewing God, revive your church in this place. Nourish and nurture the seeds you have planted that we might grow as disciples. Replace what has been depleted. Sustain our ministries and deepen relationships with the wider community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Sustaining God, we lift into your care all of those congregations and church bodies that are looking towards what ministry looks like in this time. We especially lift up John Zender, who has been hospitalized with COVID-19. And we pray for quick healing. We lift up into your care Mike Duchesne, the newly installed pastor at Peace Lutheran. And for all of those pastors and church workers that are doing ministry in the midst of the pandemic, we pray that you sustain, strengthen, and open doors that they may minister faithfully and creatively. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for all who have died, especially Amalia Garish. Comfort us in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord, who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Alleluia. The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.